Okay, uh, Dr. Manoj Chawla, just I cannot see actually. Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Manoj Chawla is a is a director and consultant diabetologist at Lina Diabetes Care and Mumbai Diabetes Research Center. He is based in uh, Andheri West. Is a consultant uh, diabetologist also working in Asal Raheja Fortis Mahim. Is the founder president of. United Diabetes Forum is an honorary visiting faculty at the DUI Patil Medical Sciences, uh, Navi Mumbai. He was awarded the RSSDI Fellowship for the year 2017 and Fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh for the year uh, 2019. He is the principal investigator in various global MNC clinical trials and he has about uh, around 20 papers in national and international journals. And he'll be speaking on obesity, diabetes, and COVID-19, anything. So over to you, Dr. Chawla. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kamita Biswas and, and Bengal Diabetes Conference for inviting me. Let me start by sharing the slides. Uh, and let me apologize that, that I'm, I'm actually traveling in the car and I have a very, very valid reason for the same. So. Uh, our alma mater, that is uh, TN Medical College and, and Nair Hospital, actually celebrates 100 years of its uh, establishment. And there have been great celebrations the whole day. Um, and I was glad to be uh, visiting the, the, the alma mater with, with my batchmates and enjoying that moment. So there was no way I would have given that up. Uh, uh, so I'm on the way back and, and hopefully there won't be any uh, network issues when we move ahead on this talk. So I'm going to be talking about diabetes, obesity, and and I, I changed the topic a little because it, I, it said COVID-19, but I think it's, uh, unfortunately, it's COVID-19, 2021, 20, and maybe 22. So I'm going to be speaking about, is there really a link? And that's as specific a topic that I've been given to speak on, the link between diabetes, obesity, and COVID. I'm also, of course, depicting here the, the multiple waves that we may encounter um, uh, with, with COVID. So spread of COVID-19 has reached pandemic proportions and um, it has represents a threat for increased morbidity and mortality, especially for patients with diabetes, obesity, and, and hypertension. So when we talk about the diabetes and COVID-19, so I'll speak initially on the link with diabetes and then move on to talk about and show the link with obesity. Epidemiological evidence suggests that diabetes is associated with high risk of infectious disease. People with diabetes are at increased risk for more pneumococcal infection, which is an independent risk factor for developing worse lower respiratory tract infections. Both individuals with type 1 and type 2 diabetes have higher risk for serious infections. 6% of infection-related hospitalization and 12% of infection-related deaths attributed to type 2 diabetes. So in a large observational study, including 1,099 patients with confirmed COVID-19 infection, and indicated that of this 1099, 173 with severe disease there uh, had, had existing comorbidities. And when you look at the analysis of which other comorbidities really existed, you see hypertension as prevalent in 23.7% of the population, 16.2 having diabetes and 5.2 having coronary heart disease. You look at more data coming in from different sections characteristics, clinical presentation, and outcomes of patients hospitalized with COVID-19. And here we saw the most common comorbidities amongst the data from New York City, 5,700 hospitalized patients. Those having hypertension were formed 56% of this population. So hypertension was right up there, followed by obesity at 41.7%, and then diabetes at 33.8%. We also started getting a lot of data on, on new onset diabetes and the link between COVID and new onset hyperglycemia. So if I look at a, a review article, a meta-analysis published in November 2020, it showed the COVID-19 infection related development of diabetes. And we see multiple papers which have shown that, of course, we don't have this established whether it's a new entity, is it a different entity, is it more temporary, is it stress hyperglycemia or more specific destruction of the beta cells, which has also been speculated. So COVID-19 related, uh, COVID-19 infection related diabetes and mortality, when you look at the numbers, almost 14.4% new onset diabetes in hospitalized patients. 
higher rates of ICU admission, even as compared to pre-existing diabetes and, and those with no diabetes. ICU admission rates, if you compare for those with new diabetes, known diabetics or those with normal glycemia, you can see 11.7% versus 4.1 versus 1.5. So those with new onset diabetes had the worst outcomes as we have seen in the past in most cases of stress hyperglycemia having poor outcomes as compared to known diabetics. Now, when we look at the link between COVID-19, the pathogenesis and diabetes, we need to remember that the entire pathway of the SARS-CoV-2 is through the attachment to the ACE2 enzyme. Now, the ACE2 is, is over uh, presented in, in individuals with diabetes, and it's present in the lungs, the heart, the kidney, the enterocytes, and of course, the pancreas and the pancreatic beta cells. So we look at this paper, which speaks about the most consistent finding being a tentative causal association between diabetes-related traits and increased ACE2 expression. So based on one of the largest uh, gene studies that they did in individuals with type 2 diabetes, almost we're talking about uh, uh, 89, uh, so 8 lakh uh, 98,000 130 individuals, they found that type 2 diabetes was causally linked to raised ACE2 expression, and that seems to be the strongest pathway. So when we talk about the mechanisms for increased susceptibility to COVID-19 and diabetes, well, this is often a, a slide that many would have seen. It's a busy slide, but it explains the entry of SARS-CoV-2 into the respiratory tract, infection of the respiratory epithelium, necrosis of the respiratory epithelium leading to pneumonia. You also look at the poor immune response. So in terms of impaired macrophage activity, impaired neutrophil recruitment, impaired uh, 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 interferon alphas productions from the NK cells. So all the pro-inflammatory pathways are exaggerated. The anti-inflammatory pathways get, get, get uh, uh, compensated there, leading to increased ACE2 expression, leading to worse infections, the in problems with cardiac dysfunction, acute renal injury, and of course the worry of cytokine storm in such individuals. When you further look at the pathways which have been spoken about, well, metabolic syndrome related conditions such as diabetes together with their predisposing conditions can etiologically be linked to COVID-19 pathogens. Then again, we talk about the, the spike protein uh, uh, with SARS virus getting attached to the ACE2 site and ACE2 becomes the host for, for the entry for the virus and then worsening of the infections. There's been emerging information. And when I say emergency, this is something which has emerged over the last year and a half. A lot more papers in the first six months of the pandemic. As we move ahead, um, we, we talk about uh, 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 the fact that those with diabetes are at increased risk of complications, including, including death. So fatality rate in patients with diabetes was much higher. We know today we look at the Indian data also overall fatality rate would be somewhere around 2 to 2.5%. But when you look at the individuals with diabetes, it was high at 7.3. So hyperglycemia predicts mortality. You look at the retrospective cohort from March 1st to April 6th. This is the early days in 2020 in 88 US hospitals. It speaks about COVID-19 patients with diabetes and uncontrolled hyperglycemia had a higher mortality than patients without diabetes or without uncontrolled hyperglycemia. So as high as 28.8% in those with, with diabetes or hyperglycemia, those who had normal glycemia or no diabetes, 6.2% there. So hyperglycemia predicts mortality and has four times worse outcomes. There seems to be a direct endocrine link, and this is an interesting paper which spoke about the angiotensin and angiotensin one to seven, which acts on the, the mass receptor pathway the mitochondrial activator system pathways, which lead to anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic response. And that would be favorable to the recovery of patients with COVID. But that doesn't happen. You don't have the ACE moving on to the ACE2 and, and, and the ACE1 to 7 pathways, but rather individuals with severe COVID-19 and diabetes have an imbalance in the activation of these pathways with increased activation of the, the AT1 receptor and the AT2 receptors. And that increased activation of the AT1 and AT2 receptors is what is responsible for vasoconstriction, inflammation, fibrosis, proliferation, and much worse outcomes in individuals with hypertension uh, leading to thrombosis, ARDS, and so on. So acute hyperglycemia and mortality have had a strong link. Hyperglycemia and type 2 are independent predictors of mortality and morbidity. 
if we again summarize these, these pathways in individuals with hyperglycemia, we're talking about metabolic inflammation. We're talking about possibility of cytokine storm. The fact that patients with diabetes and severe hyperglycemia will have impaired immune response and impaired healing. And, and the fact that the dysregulated immune response results in, in uh, aggravated and prolonged lung pathology. And of course, uh, the chances of higher viral loads. So diabetes as a risk factor for COVID-19, this is a statement from the IDF, which spoke about two main reasons for why individuals with diabetes have higher risk. Functional immunocompromised state associated with diabetes, favorable conditions like hyperglycemia, promoting more viral replication in, in, in such individuals. I'm not speaking about the management of diabetes in patients with COVID-19. I think that's a huge uh, topic in itself. But I would bring to forth the, the fact that the therapeutic aims is to keep the plasma glucose concentration largely between 70 and 180, HbA1c closer to 7. You know, where required, you would use an FGM or a CGM. The time in range to be tried and kept more than 70% and to avoid hypoglycemia. The principles of glycemic management for COVID-19, good glycemic control is essential. You, you, need, you could tailor these strategies. You could use orals where possible. You may move to using injectables, have the need to use steroids and more insulin. All of that is fine, but at the crux of it is good glycemic control. So management of diabetes is with patients with COVID-19 will, will actually be part of two aspects, whether they are on oral anti-hyperglycemic medications or those on insulin therapy, and then you will have different strategies for the same. What you need to consider for your pharmacological management is the age of the individual, the severity of COVID-19, the presence of cardiovascular comorbidities, and of course, keeping in mind the need to avoid hypoglycemia. Your targets for fasting in mild young patients, it could be aggressive 80 to 110, slightly older are those on steroids 110 to 140, and severe or critically ill 140 to 180 as the targets for fasting. And the postprandial targets are, are correspondingly listed here, as we can see. So when we look at the uh, uh, an overview of the management, well, anti-hyperglycemic agents that can cause volume depletion or hyperglycemia should be avoided. HGLT2 inhibitors have kind of been implicated in, in the DARE study and they've been found okay and safe to use, but no real benefits. Dosage of oral anti-diabetic drugs may need to be reduced. If it is necessary to stop metformin, then an alternative treatment needs to be put in place until you can start metformin. It just don't leave the patient alone. Patient on oral diabetes treatment should have their glucose testing done on a regular basis and monitor the sugars. Guidelines for insulin use in such patients, glucose levels more than 180, increase the insulin dose. Testing should be done more frequently, especially if the sugars go up beyond 270. You may want to check every four hours or advise your patient to do the same. If the blood glucose persists to remain more than 270, you may want to have a look at the urine ketones. And if there is presence of ketones, ask your patient to get in touch with you or any other healthcare provider. I move to the second part of the section quickly, which is talking about the link with obesity and diabetes. Several hundred studies provide evidence that BMI uh, is a strong linear uh, uh, risk factor for severe COVID-19 outcomes with recent studies, suggesting 5 to 10% higher risk for COVID-19 hospitalization for every kilogram per meter increase in the BMI. The genetic data concur with hazard ratios increasing by 14% for every uh, uh, kilogram per meter, uh, every single BMI point. BMI to COVID-19 links differ markedly from prior BMI infection associations and are further supported by multiple biological possible pathways. The excess adiposity appears to be important. Some modifiable risk factors for adverse COVID-19 uh, outcomes uh, are, are present through this aspect in multiple ethnicities. And it's imperative that medical systems worldwide meet this challenge by upscaling the treatment for prevention of obesity and, and, and using treatments where possible. So this is a, a study which spoke about 3,34,000 3, individuals in England during spring of 2020, which showed how increasing BMI was increasing the chances of hospital admission. So for every 10,000 people, those with stage two obesity and a BMI more than 35 had the highest chance of hospitalization as compared to those with normal BMI between 18 to 25. So obesity contributes to metabolic derangements, which could be linked to ectopic fat in the liver or pancreas, overall poor vascular health, greater thrombotic potential, and the adverse lung and renal functions in general in people with, with, with obesity. There may also be indirect links between obesity and COVID-19, such as an adverse diet-induced microburn impact on the immune deficiency. 
So when you look at the potential mechanisms, you could have systemic factors, increased cytokine uh, inflammatory production, a compromised immune system, increased insulin resistance, overall reduced heart function in an individual with obesity, decreased tissue per per perfusion, and overactivation of the RAS system. Some biomechanical factors which become important, reduced lung compliance, reduced functional residual capacity. So they're already at a higher risk. Increase esophageal and gastric pressures and increased chances of obstructive sleep apnea and hypoxemia. So all of this is increasing the vulnerability of an individual with obesity to SARS-CoV-2, increased chances of severe course of the COVID-19 infection and unfortunately higher mortality rates. And when you look at the current evidence, there is evidence through epidemiological studies. There has been some Mendelian randomization genetic studies, which have again shown the link with obesity. There have been no real great intervention trials, but small studies looking at subsets of patients undergone bariatric surgery who had their BMI reduced by 12 points, found their, their, their risk of hospitalization to be 69% lower than those who were continuing to be obese. And then there have been some biological possibilities, as I explained earlier. So obesity and COVID-19, what makes the obese host so vulnerable? You'll appreciate the higher incidence of hazard ratio in those with the higher BMIs. Look at the certain different studies, those with more than 3 and 3 point, uh, 35, you're seeing a 7.36 hazard ratio against those with obesity. Uh, at studies from fatality earlier, with more than 40 BMI, you're seeing a hazard ratio of more than 2.45. This seems to be an explanation as to what's going wrong. An obese host, there is chronic inflammation, there is immune system dysfunction, ACE2 receptor overexpression, increased viral entry and increased viral load and spread, more inflammation, insulin and leptin resistance leading to impaired immunity and severe disease and poor clinical outcome. If I further look more closely into the same pathway, it explains the more pro-inflammatory adipokine presence. The anti-inflammatory adipokines are reduced largely because of the excess fat, which leads to a substantial alteration of the cellular architecture of the adipose tissue. That's responsible for this altered milieu of the inflammation. So elevated fatty acids, reticulum stress, hypoxia, and mitochondrial dysfunction contributes. You have indirect factors as well. You have the lockdown consequences, worse diets, decreased activity. You itself has, have obesity as a causal risk factor as explained through multiple pathways. And the fact that obesity very often is linked to moderate conditions like diabetes, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, and, and so on. So really the time to upscale prevention to prevent obesity. Now, I found another interesting link between obesity, and I will emphasize only on the impact that we see here. The biological and social factors I've already spoken about, but learnings from these HN, uh, H1N1 studies showed increased viral load, increased shedding time, reduced immunity from infection, decreased vaccine efficacy, and increased chronic disease progression. I must say we have no reports as of now about reduced vaccine efficacy in the obese individuals or those with diabetes, but these were some of the learnings from the previous pandemic. So the final point that we need to understand and take home is SARS-CoV-2 causes beta cell damage, possibility of cytokine storm, possibility of ad ad admission hyperglycemia or worsening metabolic control in patients with diabetes or chances of new onset diabetes. All of this in individuals with obesity, worsening inflammation, more pro regulatory and pro-thrombotic state, older age, hypertension, and presence of renal disease, you have these as a background, there are chances of much, much poor outcome. So let me conclude by saying type 1 and type 2 diabetes are associated with increased risk of, risk of COVID-19 related hospitalization and severe outcomes, including mortality, particularly in people with poor glycemic control. Recent data have suggested an increased risk uh, associated with development of new onset diabetes following COVID-19 hospitalization. However, longer term follow-up data will determine if this kind of diabetes is more permanent. And several hundred studies provide powerful evidence that BMI is a strong linear risk factor for COVID-19 outcomes with recent studies suggesting five to 10% higher risk for COVID-19 hospitalization for every kilogram per meter square increase in BMI. With this, I thank you for, for inviting me here and hand it back to the chairperson. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chawla. Uh, you have uh, given a nice presentation. You have uh, uh, given the treatment aspect as well as the mechanisms, how uh, new onset diabetes happens uh, in uh, COVID-19, plus uh, what is the link of obesity and the severity of COVID-19.
So since uh, all the three talks are over, uh, now we can uh, go to the question answer session. Uh, I don't see any question answer uh, questions in the chat box. So uh, I can start with uh, a question to Professor uh, Sahai sir. Uh, this question is for Dr. Raha. Sahai sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, and we have yeah, everybody on the say, on the gallery yeah. platform there, so we can stop pinning on me and have the gallery, and we can have the discussion. Yes. Yeah. Sir, sir uh, you have given a nice presentation. You have said that uh, to do frequent SMBG, like uh, ideal is to do at least uh, seven times SMBG. So uh, how practically is it possible? Because patients on uh, type uh, 2 diabetes, they are on multiple insul insulin injection. They, are, they fear these pricks. Uh, they have to inject insulin. Plus, they have to prick their fingers for this SMBG. So practically, how, what would you suggest to the practicing clinicians, number one? Okay. Second, uh, one more thing, sir. Uh, is there any role of frequent SMBG in, uh, say, type 2 diabetes mellitus patient uh, who are on OHAs, poorly controlled. Not yeah, so I think uh, what I was trying to show is that highlight in my talk was that uh, even when it is done once a day, uh, uh, it was it was found to have very good value. It uh, brought out brought down the risk of complications by almost, uh, uh, almost 10 percent reduction in all the complications. And uh, bring uh, it, it was done very cost effectively. I mean, over a period of uh, 10 years, there was a good saving in terms of the money spent on SMBG being also calculated and all that. So there is a great benefit of doing SMBG even in patients with uh, type 2 diabetes who are not on insulin. On insulin, definitely it is valuable. You, uh, I mean, all the guidelines, even the ESI, uh, uh, ESI, RSSDI guideline is recommending doing it uh, on the minimum once a day in insulin treated patients. While in non-insulin treated patients also, you see the benefits in terms of uh, providing them, uh, providing feedback in, uh, on, on the dietary uh, uh, habits, on the exercise patterns. So it helps in several ways and in deciding therapy, changes in therapy. So it helps in several ways and uh, intensified uh, uh, monitoring as uh, doing it about three, four times in a day or even seven times in a day is recommended in some situations like in uh, managing patients with gestational diabetes, managing patients with type 1 diabetes where there are significant fluctuations in the glucose levels. In such situations, it may be required more frequently. But otherwise, even once in a day is a very practical approach and it can be useful even in patients who are not on insulin. Thank you, sir. Uh, may, may I give a one comment? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I think Rakesh very rightly pointed out that even you do a one single value of a glucose in patients with type 2 diabetes who are even on OHS is helpful. But what it means? It means that the patient is induced to involve in his own care. So even by doing a single value, patients become more vigilant because they know that what is the output. So they can modify their lifestyle or they can modify their medications. What I do in clinical with that I would like to share with you is that those who are on oral hypoglycemic agents, we usually recommend to them that to ask to do the blood glucose postprandial. So two yeah. hours postprandial, suppose it comes high in more than 200. Then either they do some exercise or they reduce their diet or calorie intake for the next week. While those are insulin, you should preferably do a pre-meal so you can modify the doses accordingly. So I think you can ask even the person which type of blood glucose values they want and how can you modify it. Even you do a single value, even in patients with OHS. And doing a pattern value, that is doing at different times of the day. If you're doing post-meal, do different post-meals. That is one day you do it after breakfast, another yeah. day you do it after lunch, another yes, day you so do it after will, dinner. That will that clearly that... give an idea of a 24-hour glucose profile if you do like a three post-meal values, but you modify accordingly. Thank you, sir. Uh, 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 sir, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Amartya, yeah. please go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, thank, I thank all the speakers for the wonderful deliberation. It's always a delight to listen to them. Uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Deep Doctor here? Deep. Yes. Yeah, he's there. 
Deep, the thank you. It was a very nice and lucid presentation. Uh, I have just uh, two queries. One, uh, you have very nicely highlighted the mixed mill. It's a very uh, easily available and cheap mixed mill, which uh, the study which you have shown with good day biscuit and the amul lychee mill. I think that is a very practical way of testing the mixed mill. Now we have a lot of health drinks available in the market. I mean, like the Ensure and the Prohans, Prohans D. These are some of the brand names to mention. If I can mention them. So, uh, do you have, think there is any utility or any like we can use these as a substitute for the mixed meal test? If you can advise the patient. Let me start first of all paying my regards to all the teachers here on on Teachers Day. We have teachers here, teachers here, Bansali sir here. My regards to you, sir. Uh, coming uh, to uh, the question, I think nothing prevents us. We are flexible about it. You can use any branded protein supplements or health supplements. The idea is to replicate a meal around 400 to maybe 450 kilocalories per day with a good representation around 40 to 50 percent carbs, around maybe 30 percent of pro uh, proteins and 20 percent of fats. The, the advantage of using any of the proprietary meal supplements, they have a food label available there. You can read it. You can do the calculation so whatever you are comfortable at your center or opd you can standardize it and use it in your practice there's no fix that you have to use such a care or you have to use gatorade or anything it's not it doesn't work like that yeah okay if i can I, ask a question to dr deep Datta, i just yes, wanted sir. to ask him he he started off his talk with a very interesting uh, observation that uh, you know uh, c peptide has got several roles to play in in uh, kidney disease and several other uh, issues uh, in, in types of in terms of heart failure uh, regulation and all that so um, but we don't have any therapeutic uh, uh, role identified as yet so what i was what i was trying to ask him is that uh, do you look at a difference in terms of you know in a patient who is receiving insulin ther therapy versus somebody who is receiving a glp1 therapy a GLP-1 therapy probably theoretically can increase the C-peptide levels also. Could it have additional benefits as compared to somebody who's on insulin, insulin versus GLP-1 uh, in a patient with, uh, say, type 2 diabetes? Sir, so, as expected, you always ask the toughest questions. I don't have a clear answer for this. A great question, sir. I think I have to go back and read about it. But as you said, uh, GLP-1 has a lot of pleiotrophic benefits we have seen. We know that it is a superior agent in terms of improving cardiovascular outcomes. Maybe it is one of the mechanisms by which it exerts its benefits. The full answer, I don't have to a question, sir. If Dr. Bansali, sir, has some comments on this. Yeah, sir. I would like to answer. I think the I think question is very pertinent and very likely asked. Uh, theoretically, yes, because the GLP-1 will definitely increase C-peptide and uh, insulin while versus exogenous insulin. But, but let us see rather what is the contribution of the C-peptide in, uh, in facilitating these actions from the heart. Or, only I think where the, most of the studies are available, that is for a diabetic neuropathy, where the C-peptide have been shown to be effective. But otherwise, otherwise, for the rest of the illnesses, the rest of the concurrent comorbidities, I think the role is only plausible. So I just say that the contribution or the effect size of the C peptide on different organ functions is still remains to be elucidated. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, one last question to Deepa again. So, uh, 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 when, uh, is there any cutoff uh, would you suggest to and in the post mixed meal C peptide level? Is there any cutoff you suggest where you'd consider that OHS will still be effective in the type of management of type 2 diabetes patients because we are, when you're thinking of changing to insulin, the patients are still not convinced to start off insulin. We are still on continuing OHS with three, four OHS. So if we, to see whether the adequate adequacy of the insulin reserve, is there any cutoff you'd suggest that uh, beyond which we can safely and reliably continue OADs in these patients? Well, the answer to it is that we, we need to develop ethnicity-based, uh, cohort-based, population-based cutoffs. The C-peptide assay is interfered by so many variables. The underlying insulin resistance, underlying the glucotoxicity, the degree of glycemic control. So it would be fallacious to expect an upper cutoff, but we have data to show that if you have done a stimulated one-hour post-meal C-peptide, and if the value comes less than 0.6 nanograms per ml, it is reasonable to assume that patient has virtually has um, minimal to no clinically significant beta cell function. There is no point of beating such pancreas with more OADs. Going for insulin therapy is the safest and the best way to manage diabetes in them. I, I think just deep, sorry to interrupt you here. 
Yes, sir. Uh, one comment is even even unstimulated. Even you do a fasting sleep peptide, if it yes, is sir. less than 0.6 nanogram per ml, it is very likely to be a either a severe insulin deficiency or maybe a LADA or maybe type of diabetes. If it is a more than fasting sleep peptide is more than 1.2 nanogram per ml, likely to be have a reasonably good result and may respond to OHA. If you do a stimulated sleep peptide, glucagon is less preferable than the mixed meal. The mixed meal is a more comprehensive than the glucagon. And they say the cutoff usually seen in various white population, that is around more than three nanogram per ml. If it is there, then it is likely to be very very significant that they may continue to respond to oral hypoglycemic agents. But do you see that it all depends on what assay you use. One, and secondly, the lot of variability, not of because of ethnicity, but what BMI you have. So that's another major important factor of deciding the uh, level of CPAP. Thank you, sir. Uh, I want ask you a quick question, uh, okay. organizers. I'll just take half a minute, and this is to, oh. to Deep and, and to Dr. Bansali. So we're speaking about C-peptide. Uh, is there any role of doing this evaluation while on the treatment, or are we talking only at the beginning for diagnostic purpose? Is there a role, say, 5 years, 10 years down, diabetes, again trying to evaluate C-peptide for somebody who's already been on OHA for a while? It can be done anytime. It's important to keep in mind before ordering the test, why are we doing the test? What are we trying to achieve by doing the test? So it depends if a patient who is not convinced to just start insulin, it's a great way to convince the patient. So some, so some concrete data, see your beta cell reserve is virtually not working. It's time you go on insulin, right? Uh, I just showed a paper in my presentation. There are studies to show that in post-metabolic surgery, uh, if the uh, if if the C peptide levels are more than three nanograms per ml, Bansali says quoted the same value, they have a very high uh, role in going to diabetes remission. So now remission. we talk of diabetes remission for these people. So if you want to see your patients who are likely to go into remission, I think people who have a very robust C-peptide value, if they go for a good therapeutic diet and lifestyle change and weight loss, they, we can try to achieve that. So it can be done any point of the duration of diabetes. It's important to know before ordering the test, what are we trying to look for? Okay, thank you. I have a quick question to Dr. Uh, Manoj Chawla. So you said that around 18-20% uh, of uh, patients uh, in COVID-19 have new onset diabetes. So in those patients, uh, even uh, if the glycemia, hyperglycemia is not very severe, do you start with insul insulin or which is in new onset diabetes? Yeah. So again, the, the new onset diabetes, the treatment choice completely depends on, on patient's severity of the uh, infection. So if, if the patient uh, doesn't have severe form of COVID, is still having, uh, is being treated at home, is orally uh, able to ingest, you may very well use uh, any of the oral drugs which are warranted and which have been proven to be safe to use. Your choice or need to use insulin would only depend if there is severe infection or you're using steroids or this patient is in a critical situation, then of course, your natural choice is going to be insulin. So the, the choice of therapy is going to be dependent on the, the other factors that I just mentioned, and not just the fact that somebody has new onset hyperglycemia post-COVID. I think one comment I would like to make. Hello, may I make one comment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. so I think Manoj rightly pointed out that it all depends on severity of disease. But I think the one OHA which is the most preferred in COVID-19 is DPP-4. DPP-4. Yeah, the DPP-4 has got an additional role of preventing the entry of the virus into the lung because the DPP-4 receptor is also present to the lung epithelia. So the DPP-4, this entry of the COVID-19 can also be prevented by that. That's why if you see the recommendations, even in patients, those who are on, uh, those who are severely ill, even DPP-4 can be continued. But for it all depends on severity. If they have mild disease, then you can continue uh, your metformin and you can continue DPP-4 inhibitor. But if they are having a severe disease, best is you resort to insulin. But only the safest drug or the beneficial drug effects is DPP-4 inhibitors. Thank you, sir. So if there are uh, no more questions, I think uh, we can conclude this session. I thank uh, all the speakers and all the participants for this lively discussion. Uh, and with this, I think we can conclude this session. Thank you.